German peasants who went to their slaughter in 1525 discovered the hard way what we had learned through long retrospection. That Lutheranism, after all, was no clarion call to a social revolution, one that would finish off feudalism and at the same time bypass capitalism. But that the institutionalized, reformed churches that Lutheranism established and turned over into the hands of very conservative pastors would become a bastion of the established order. And that the revolutionary project, once those churches, after all, had cast their aspersion and cast their anathema upon it, would finally come to reside in the very desperate dreams and the sporadic uprisings of heretical religious sects. All of which causes us to raise a fundamental question, the last one that we raised to the 16th century. For we must come to grips, if we possibly can, with a proposition which weighs very heavily upon our understanding of the great transformation of human communities, that Protestantism in the 16th century, far from clearing societies of its class oppression, managed after all to retool and reshape the human personality of millions of men and women so that they were prepared through their disciplined work and through their feverish material quests for the success and the triumph of capitalism. All of which raises the question that Tony and Weber raised and that we began our long discussion with, the question about the symbiosis between the Protestant ethic and the ideology of capitalism. What is it that we can say about it? How can we come to grips with it? It is a critical question. And it leads us directly and irrevocably to Calvin and to the trajectory of the Calvinist movement. For you cannot underestimate the importance of Calvinism in the reshaping of human behavior and the reshaping of human values on the part of masses of Reformed Protestants in the course of the 16th and 17th centuries. And it seems to me that you can begin to weigh that high importance of Calvinism in history if you keep three considerations very carefully in mind. That in the first place, it is Calvinism and not the Lutheranism from which it sprang, which really would become the mainstream of the Protestant Reformation. That in the two centuries after Luther made his historic break with the Church of Rome, that the varieties and the influential groupings of Protestants in Europe really descended by one path or another from the teachings of Calvin and that it is Calvinism and not Lutheranism from which it sprang, which became, in one country or another, a political and a social force, and which gives to Calvinism the quality of being what it is, an international movement. And note in the second place, because it is critical to your understanding, that Calvin, after all, was born in 1509, which means that he came a full generation, 25 years after Luther, that Calvin belonged to the second generation of reformers. And for that second generation, the critical problem wasn't really to make the break with Rome that had been done. The critical problem, after all, was to create the structure and also to chart the strategy of the new reformed churches. To situate those churches in the face of the economic and social realities of the age to influence all processes in that age by insinuating the influence of the church into every facet of life. To use those churches, if you please, as a springboard, not only for the purification of individual faith, but in the final analysis for a reform of society from the top to the bottom. Because you are talking in Calvinism about an activist faith, Lutheranism, after all we know, became socially conservative, very deferential of established political authorities, and ultimately advocated the kind of personal faith which was almost quietistic. 
That is not true of Calvinism. It is activist. It is nervous. It is penetrating. It is social and political. It interferes in the institutions and in the ways of 16th and 17th century societies. And you see, it is in a letter that Calvin himself wrote to the King of France, Francis I, and which he appended as a preface to his famous Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he published in 1536, in which Calvin said precisely that Calvinist Protestantism was radical, reformist, that it had a revolutionary spirit. Now remember that Calvin was in exile when he wrote that that the year before, in 1535, he had been driven out of France precisely by the persecution of that French king, Francis I. Frenetic he was, that king, over the fact that the Protestants might be subversives and that they might overthrow the monarchy, looking as he did at the antics of those Anabaptists in Münster in 1535. And Calvin answered him and said, yes, you are right that there is a subversive quality about us Calvinists. And it is because any reformed Protestant, who after all hews to the word of the Bible, cannot look at that social order without wanting to reform it, because that social order is mired in moral disorder. But we are not the real subversive, says Calvin. The real subversives are those who create that moral disorder. They are the idlers, they are the parasites, they are the exploiters of society. And so he is already indicating that this is a faith, a church, which may turn the world upside down. He is already targeting the old social elites as the enemy, the nobility of Europe, of the rapacious clergy of the Roman church. But if it is a revolution that Calvin is talking about, it is for whom and by whom. Not certainly for and by the laboring poor, but rather for and by the active, frenetic, aspiring middle classes of Europe. And so the third point to consider is the point that is made by a neo-Leonard in his great and massive history of Protestantism when he concludes his section on Calvin by saying that indeed Calvin was the architect of bourgeois civilization. That after all, in his pastorate in Geneva, that he had adapted daily Christian practice to what would become the behavioral and the ideological requirements of capitalism. And it is tawny in a brilliant insight in religion and the rise of capitalism, who reminds us that Calvin was as much the ideologue of the bourgeoisie of the 16th and 17th centuries as Marx would become of the proletariat in the 19th and 20th centuries. That what Calvin did, after all, was to devise a doctrine of predestination, which assured to that aspiring capitalist class, still surrounded by hostile aristocratic terrain, to assure them that they were the elect in God's providential plan. And by comparing, with a great deal of emphasis on their work, by comparing their very sterling economic virtues, their hard work, their diligence, uh, their sobriety, with the parasitism, uh, with the idleness of the aristocracy that was the ruling class, what Calvin did was to give them the confidence that they were the chosen race that in effect, after all, they have the obligation uh, to turn society upside down, uh, to release its economic energies, uh, to increase its productivity, uh, to smash down uh, the walls of immobility and the walls of tradition and past procedure. And it was Calvin who gave them that resolute will to move toward that particular goal and to fulfill it. So that, ultimately, by comparison to an aristocracy that really was degenerate in the 18th century, in comparison to <laughs> monarchies that were half bankrupt, the bourgeoisie of Europe became a race of iron.
so that it was prepared at the political crunch to make the revolutions which finally would enshrine its power and would enshrine also its way of life. And yet, we must be warned that the problem of the relationship between Calvinism and capitalism is not nearly as simple, alas, as it seems. That it is much more ambiguous and much more complex. That in no way can you assume that John Calvin was a self-conscious ideologue of an unrestrained capitalism. That you are dealing, after all, first and foremost with a theologian who was no less obsessed with the damnation of mankind, with the corruption of the human race, than Martin Luther was. You would go far and wide before you would find a text that rings with such pessimism about the human condition as the text we find in Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion that reads this way, men think so highly of themselves and pride themselves on their freedom but God sees in them nothing but utter filth. And so we, won't, we would hardly find in Calvin one who would be praised upon the unrestrained economic appetites of capitalists, or one who would varnish or with the brush of religious sanction the cupidity of those who were engaged in trade and finance and industry. Far from it. What you're dealing with is a man whose primary concern is the salvation of a human race that has gone so very far in its degradation. And even more to the point, you must remember that Calvin's despair didn't spring as Luther's did from a frenetic and paralyzing kind of doubt about his own salvation, but rather from his frontal social experience. You see, Calvin was no medieval monk who passed his days in contemplating his spiritual navel, but this was a man of the world, after all. Somebody who was out in the world and knew perfectly well what the 16th century societies were about, who came, after all, to hate a nobility that lived off the labor of others, who came to hate a Roman clergy that seemed to him rapacious and quite useless, but who was no more indulgent toward the cupidity of capitalists as he saw it in the cities of the 16th century. Because Calvin's texts are studded with all kinds of warning against the dominion of mammon, against worshiping wealth, against living a life only to acquire wealth. He says that the dominion of mammon, after all, means not only the perversion of the individual, but it means the severing of the community. It means that all bonds in the community are disrupted and severed. Does it surprise us then that in his mission in Geneva, which was to last those 23 years between 1541 and 1564, that Calvin was at pains to subordinate economic activity to the ironclad rules of Christian morality, that he was at pains to create a theocracy in Geneva, by which we mean a all powerful church which defies the rules of Christian morality and then handed them over to the secular arm to impose upon the populace. Nor, we are, nor are we surprised that in that Geneva you have a society regulated from top to bottom in which the state and church interfere in every facet of life, in which the homo economicus of 18th century English capitalism couldn't have lasted an hour without being excommunicated. <clears throat> and even that didn't satisfy Calvin or his successor, Beza, who succeeded him on his death in 1564. And so if you look at the servants of Calvin and Beza, spanning that 50 years of the last half of the 16th century, you find them full of sentiments that seem to come right out of the Old Testament prophets. Here is Calvin in 1562. The poor cry 
and the rich pocket their gains. But what are they heaping up? But what they are heaping up for themselves is the wrath of God. And here is Beza in 1571. One has cried in the midst of the marketplace, a curse on those who bring us that dirt. The Lord has heard their cry, and yet we are asking the cause of this pestilence when we know full well it is the vice of the rich. How then, with sentiments of that kind, could you possibly have within the ambit of Calvinism the full and unrestrained play of market capitalism? That is the problem. And how then to resolve that dilemma? How is it that that Calvin, who is so censorious about economic appetites, can be called by a distinguished historian of Protestantism, the architect of bourgeois civilization? By what ironic process of serendipity did that kind of tremendous uh, collectivism in Geneva of the 16th century become the rugged individualism of Puritan capitalism in 17th and 18th century England? Those are critical questions, and in part, they lead us back to the social experience of Calvin and certainly to his theology. Because you must remember that Calvin really is a man of the world. That he is born into and grows up in a very worldly and bourgeois milieu. That he has nothing but contempt for that idealized version of an hierarchical medieval society. And that he finds nothing wrong with the mere fact of capitalism in trade or in industry or in finance. You see this Calvin passed his life in commercial cities. He is born in 1509 in a northwestern, uh, northeastern entrepot in France called Moyen. And Moyen, a commercial city of some importance in Picardy. And the father of John Calvin, Gerard Covan, as the original name was, was a prosperous lawyer and so adept in financial affairs that he became the secular administrator for the far-flung economic operations of the bishop. And so we're not surprised that Gerard the father chooses for John Calvin a legal career. Because, as the father says, that is the sure road to wealth and honors. And the boy is attracted and magnetized by theology, but he obeys. And so he goes to the law school and becomes a lawyer from the University of Orléans in 1529, and then plunges into a practical career up to his neck, if you please, in business transactions and in worldly affairs, until in 1531, Gerard dies and John leaves the law at once and goes then to Paris to study theology and there studies it for two years and in 1533 by a process that Calvin who is much more attentive about this than Luther doesn't reveal to us by some process became converted to Protestantism and so from 1533 to 5 he is in Paris preaching the new reformed word until the persecution of the Protestants of Francis I forces Calvin to flee the country in that year. And for the next six years, until 1541, Calvin wanders and preaches, but from one Protestant city to another. His experience and horizon remains urban and commercial. And it is finally in 1541 that the Christian community of the newly converted Protestant city Republic of Geneva calls John Calvin to the mission which would consume him for the rest of his life until his death in 1564, which was to build the evangelical church of that city, Republic of Geneva, 
and to forge within the limits of that newly independent city republic, having just won its independence from the Catholic Duchy of Savoy to construct in its limits the authentic Christian Commonwealth. But Geneva, we know, is a commercial city. And is that the plinth upon which you erect an authentic Christian commonwealth? And how Geneva is a commercial city? Well, you have to have been in Geneva to know what I mean. It has a very special quality, a vulgarity about it, that somehow there is something peculiarly, peculiarly stupid, bad, as the French say, about the way in which they conduct their affairs, without lilt, without merriment, only with money involved. And so Calvin goes to form the Christian Commonwealth in Geneva. And from the beginning of the 15th century, that city had been internationally known for its trade. It had an international fair every year to which merchants and financiers came from far and wide, which connected the trade of the Mediterranean with the trade of Central Europe. Now granted that Geneva was not a prime industrial entrepot, that its crafts produced mainly for the local market. That is until the 1550s, because then you get the influx of Protestant refugees from France and from Italy, and you get the first export industries in Geneva, in bookmaking and in silk textiles. And granted also that the city is no very first-rank city like London or like Amsterdam, a city modest enough so that the middle classes have to really scramble in order to succeed. And add to that, that by the time Calvin arrived in that city in 1541, its economy had come upon hard times because the fairs of the city of Lyon had begun to bypass it, because the Atlantic routes had begun to diminish the economic importance of Mediterranean trade, because Geneva sat surrounded by the hostile terrain of the Duchy of Savoy, which cut off its natural commercial hinterland. All of which meant that in order for that economy to satisfy in any way the needs of its population, those middling classes and those workers had to have all of those economic qualities of drive, of, persper of perspiration, certainly of, of tremendous regularity and of diligence, all of which, after all, Calvin would so effectively inculcate. But was it possible, and this is the question, was it possible to create an authentic Christian commonwealth in a capitalist nest? And Calvin's answer is critical because it is a watershed. And he said, yes. And he accepted, after all, the general practices and principles of capitalism that he accepted, after all, banks, and he accepted credit, and he accepted wage labor, he accepted the way in which business ran, and because he accepted it, he made a watershed in the history of Christian economic thought. Because, after all, the traditional economic attitudes of religious thinkers had been to look upon self-subsistence societies as kind of an ideal, and to consider merchants or middlemen to be parasites, and to consider bankers to be thieves. But Calvin goes all the way in the other direction, and he says not only are merchants and financiers not thieves, but they have perhaps a better right to collect profit on their enterprise than landowners do, who are parasitical and just collect rents. And consequently, in a letter to a correspondent about the profits of trade and finance, Calvin writes, what reason is there why the income from business should not be larger than from landowning? 
Whence do the merchants come? Whence do the merchants' profits come? Except from his own diligence and industry, and that is not true of our aristocratic landowners. And yet, complexity. <clears throat> because we can by no means assume that since Calvin accepted the fundaments of business and of capitalism, that he sought to construct in Geneva a kind of playground for economic appetites, or that he was making of it a 16th century Las Vegas, <laughs> nothing could have been further from the truth. Because you must remember that Calvin is a theologian, and that when he looks at society, he really is sore depressed. He sees depravity that he has confronted himself as he has traveled around. The exploitation of one by another, the cupidity and all that. You read the texts of Calvin and you really are in the same universe of Albert Camus' The Fall. That universe in which everyone is inauthentic, in which everyone is alienated, in which everyone has greed to do in the other in which, after all, there seems to be a total fall. So that when Calvin arraigns the human race for having cut its bonds with God, what he's talking about is the incapacity of men and women to live in solidarity anymore in the community. You see, if John Calvin had only been a revolutionary socialist, he would have understood that the crisis he was defining was really a crisis rooted in profound class inequalities and that only a revolution which arranged the relationships of production differently and ended the exploitation of many by a few could have begun to resolve that crisis. But alas, he wasn't. And he was a 16th century theologian. And consequently, when he came to pose the question, is there any hope at all? Is there any salvation for the human race? He did it in perfectly orthodox religious terms. Because in the final analysis, if human beings are too puny to reach God, God doesn't deserve his puny race. And consequently, he sent Jesus among them to show them, after all, what the original human nature was about and to show them the way back to God. And the way back to God is the communion with the invisible Christ, or it is the love of God, or to put it more precisely, it is the love of one's fellow being. Because Calvin is a social theologian. He cannot conceive of salvation. He cannot conceive of regeneration, of an individual isolated Christian. For him there is no such thing as simply passive contemplation. There is no such thing as regeneration all by yourself. That that regeneration comes through the only living proof that you are really on the road to salvation and have been touched by God's grace. And that proof is in your social relationships, in your rapport, after all, with your family, with your friends, with your community. So go back to the economic program, the economic strategy of Calvin, and you come to understand what it will be about that granted there is an acceptance of the capitalist phenomena, but at every point, the practices and the institutions and the ways of capitalism are snared in the net of Christian practice. At every point, there is acceptance, and then there is obligation, then there is a kind of amendment which cuts to the very quick. Consider the examples of that that are so very important in understanding that phenomenon of Calvin's Geneva. Consider, for example, Calvin on the question of the inequality between rich and poor. Yes, he accepted the inequality between rich and poor as being God-given, but you cannot keep it that way.
there must be what he calls a constant redistribution in society, not to eliminate those inequalities, but at least to attenuate them. Which means that the rich person has his wealth in order to share it, that he shows God's grace, that he uses his wealth in God's way when he gives to the poor, and that the poor has a mission in, eye, in God's eyes because he stands there as the neighbor of the rich and enables him to do his Christian duty. And in Calvin, it is over and again that way. It is the question, for example, of whether there is in, uh, whether there is in, uh, uh, in uh, the inequality, in the uh, uses of wealth, the possibility of living for wealth. No, says Calvin, we must not seek the goods of this world because we covet them. If we have riches, we must either love, we must neither love nor serve them. We must always be willing to give them up when God commands. For we must constantly and forever seek the spiritual kingdom of Christ, which is love. Or, whether you have grace or whether you are damned depends upon the way in which you use your wealth. But wealth is a sign with a twofold meaning. It is a sign of grace for him who, through faith, acknowledges that all his possessions came to him from God. But it is also a sign of condemnation of him who gets the goods of his living without discerning that they are the gift of God. And the worst of all is to separate the material and the spiritual realms, precisely what the modern age has done in the name of Calvinism. To make that separation and say that you can act as you choose in your material relationships if you go to church and pray on Sunday. Mammon allows man full liberty to practice his own religion and to say his prayers. He even suggests to man to make two parts of his life, the spiritual and the material. The most important thing, he says, is not to mix the two domains, but we cannot have two gods. We cannot have two goals. As Jesus says, we cannot in practice serve two such incompatible masters as God and money. All of which means that Calvin didn't even trust that kind of preachment and establish within Geneva a special order inside the church called the Order of the Deacons. And that was a commission who was to look, which was to look after the alms giving to the poor, which was to look after the sick, or which was to prod the rich uh, into their duty. At all points, Calvin is discouraged enough about the human species so that he adds institutions in Geneva uh, to be beef up of their generosity. Or take the question of commerce. In no way does Calvin criticize commerce. In fact, he sanctifies it. And he is the first of the religious thinkers uh, to do so. And it is what links him, after all, uh, to the whole capitalist phenomenon. And his argument is again uh, the argument of human solidarity. Uh, that God had created all of the callings on earth, all of the tasks, and he had assigned each to a special task. So that there is what we would call a division of labor. And each, consequently, is dependent upon the goods and services of others. So that for that solidarity, that interdependence of the community, which God has created, really to work its way out, the merchant has a very special mission. But if he's crooked, that's different. And if that merchant prevents that circulation of goods, if he monopolizes, if he forestalls, if he regrets, if he charges high prices, all of that is a crime, all of that is to be punished, and in Geneva under Calvin they punish such crimes with great rapidity, and the state itself intervened to set the prices of necessities, of the price of wine, and the price of bread, and the price of meat. In no way did Calvin leave to the vicissitudes of the market the wages of workers. Workers had to work. It was their mission. They had a calling. 
but they needed a living wage. And a living wage is not a market wage in Calvin's terminology. It is, after all, what enables man to live dignified in the eyes of God. And so he inveighs against those capitalists who exploit the, the surfeiting of the labor market, who come to those times when there is a surplus of labor and begin to cut the wages of men to the point that they are unlivable. And so Calvin says about that, that to create, that for behold what the rich do so often, they wait for occasions to cut down by half the wages of poor people who desperately need their jobs. Such behavior is not only cruel, but it defrauds the poor man. And yet, Calvin is no revolutionary. He doesn't permit in Geneva for workers to organize. He doesn't permit for them to strike. But he himself goes on occasion after occasion before the 200-man city council and begs that the wages of certain groups of workers be raised. And on unemployment, even more impassioned. Calvin, of course, hates idleness, can't see anybody sitting still, can't see any hands idle, is really frenetic about that, but really despises the idle who want to be idle, the aristocrats who live off others, or the beggars who prefer to live as mendicants. But think of the poor unemployed who can't find work and want to work, and that is a curse. Because, says Calvin, it alienates man completely from his godly function. It makes of him an unhuman being. And so Calvin urges the city government of Geneva uh, to expand uh, the silk weaving industry, uh, to create a vocational training uh, for the children of the poor, uh, to create uh, the conditions uh, for employment. And then, finally, the question which comes closest to the marrow. And that is the question of interest or usury. Because the turning point with Calvin, as is frequently noted, is that he approved interest and he approved usury and that he is the first theologian to do so and that he is really a modern man. And yet, look close. Read that sermon on interest. And you find that you can take interest, but you damn well better watch out what you're doing. That first of all, you can take interest, but no more than the maximum set by the state. And in fact, in 1568, after the death of Calvin, a group of businessmen in Geneva tried to found a bank and charge 10% interest, and the priests or the ministers simply shut them up, said we don't need that kind of exploitation. Secondly, that interest taking can never really hurt the poor. That the poor must never be charged for loans given to them. By which we mean that loans must always be for production. They must always be capitalist loans, never for consumption, never for people in need. Third, that those loans should always benefit the borrower as much as the credit as the creditor. And finally, that in no interest taking ever should one person harm the neighbor. Well, it sounds almost medieval. But the point is, you see, the significant thing about Calvin's lecture on usury is that he did accept interest taking. He did accept credit as really an inevitable and necessary instrument in the life of society. And that he considered the reward for giving that money at interest to be no less important and no less admirable than, let us say, taking bread from land. So you are face to face with the great contradiction that here is Calvinism, and it embraces into its bosom capitalism, but it doesn't embrace it as some kind of suppliant saying, come, we will make a compromise. It embraces it as some kind of master, and it towers over it, and it says, yes, capitalism, you are in my embrace, and I will make you also a disciplined part 
of the spiritual life. And so for 50 years, those pastors went crazy in Geneva. And they were just like those old Hebraic prophets. And they were everywhere, under beds, in houses, <laughs> looking through glasses. They were everywhere, making sure that the society was not avaricious, that the society had not fallen into cupidity, that the society had not sinned and given way to its economic appetites. And Calvin himself, in his ordinances of 1541, in which he established the government of the Church of Geneva, established a special order of elders, a kind of moral squad that was picked out of from the 200-person town council. And that moral squad was around, looking to see what kind of economic advantages people were taking, what kind of moral sins they were committing. And when they caught the culpable ones, they turned them over to a special court created by the church in Geneva called the Consistory, made up of ministers and of laymen. And that Consistory tried thousands and thousands of Genevans in the course of its history. And they sent off to jail those who were unscrupulous creditors. And they sent off to jail of those merchants who defrauded. And they sent off to jail of those clothiers who, who adulterated their product. And they sent off to jail those who had displayed too much finery. All kinds of moral sumptuary wars, all kinds of economic crimes brought before this consistory uh, and punished. And all of it you see within the framework of trying to moralize this capitalism. Because after the death of Calvin in 1564, and in the period when Beza was the chief minister of the city until 1605, the ministers really went wacky. And every year, every month, they were at the city council asking for more laws, stricter laws, more extensive laws to protect the society against extortionate interest, against extortionate prices, fighting a war <coughs> and losing it. And there is part of your answer. When you ask about the transition from that Geneva experience to the capitalist modalities of the 17th and 18th century, part of the answer is precisely the failure of that collective experience in Geneva in the 16th century. Because you see, it was self-defeating from the beginning. Calvin began by accepting the system and then tried to moralize the system. But you see what that's about. That has the same chance as any effort to reform capitalism, which is zero. Because fundamentally, and at the bottom, there is an exploitative mechanism that after all, the motor force of the system is to maximize gain at the expense of the wage earner or the consumer. So that Calvin could invade all he liked about, against the abuses of the accumulation of capital. But if he accepted the accumulation of capital, where do the abuses begin and the justice end? And consequently, all of that came a cropper by 1605. Because when Beza died, the bourgeoisie of Geneva revolted. And they were certainly not averse to hearing the sermons of that pastors were preaching to the masses and telling them that they had to be disciplined. But they didn't like sermons that talked about their covetousness. And they certainly didn't like controls over prices and controls over interest. And they wouldn't obey them anymore. And so, in fact, and that is part of the explanation. But the strongest and biggest bridge that is built between that Calvinism and a later capitalism is built by Jean Calvin himself. And it is, of course, his doctrine of predestination. And what flows from that doctrine of predestination, the work ethic, 
the discipline, the sobriety, the frugality. And he himself, in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, describes this process of predestination. God not only foresaw the fall of the first man, but arranged all by the determination of his own will. Certain ones he chose as his elect, predestined to salvation from eternity, by his gratuitous mercy, totally irrespective of human merit. The rest are doomed to damnation by a just but incomprehensible judgment. This means that the human being has no input into salvation, that fundamentally it is all predetermined, and consequently he is sore frightened. And how is it that he can tell whether he is touched by grace or not? Only by that frenetic honoring and glorying of God. Only by that frenetic glorification, not only by prayer, but by economic activity. Only by sanctifying the world that God has made by constant work, incessant work, constant struggle against indiscipline, constant struggle against sin. And out of all that come certain virtues. They are the virtues, after all, of Protestantism. They are the virtues of hard work, of thrift, of frugality, of discipline, but they become also the virtues of capitalism. And consequently, the symbiosis lies there in that kind of characterological change which comes about. What Calvin finally left in Geneva were not restraints over economic appetites. What he left was the system, the sanctification of the system, and people who had discipline. Because the greatest consequence of this doctrine of predestination is the ethic of work, in the Calvinist view, God created all of those callings, all of those tasks. Each one is called to one of those tasks. And if that person works well and succeeds, then the sign of grace is there. And so if that is at the center of life, if that is at the center of hope, then idleness and poverty, those are to be condemned. And Calvin, who had a sympathy for the poor who couldn't find jobs, had no sympathy for random idleness, no sympathy for beggars, no sympathy for those who somehow or another really hadn't made it. You begin to say that careers are open not to talents, but to character. And the middle class, which is succeeding, begins to get that ideology of success, that ideology of its own strength. You see, when this is transferred, into other society. When it moves up into England, in the Puritanism of the 17th century, it is, in the first half of the 17th century, a very progressive force. It is a progressive force because, after all, what it's talking about is organizing a society for better production, so that there will be more consumption. It is a kind of breakthrough in a society in which there was so much indolence, so many same days, so much indiscipline. And also, it helps those who are the industrious middling classes. It helps the yeomanry of a small artisan, of a small merchant, of those who are the industrious and are working hard to get a little further. And this whole Puritan doctrine, this whole Calvinist ethos really helps them, gives them the feeling that if they do discipline themselves, then somehow they can turn the world upside down. In a brochure called The Wolf Breading at the Land, Thomas Adams, a pamphleteer in England in 1629, wrote something very perceptive. They are very hot for the gospel, not because they believe it, but because they feel it. The wealth, the peace, the liberty that arises by it. 
In other words, that something of their universe can be created with this kind of a doctrine. And pushing one step further, in that first half of the 17th century, before that English Revolution, remember that a doctrine that really does sanctify work, that justifies work, is a doctrine that justifies the lower classes, that after all, it is the idle rich who have been the ruling classes. Now you're saying that really the people who count in society are the ones who work, and you carry that a step further, and you already have a revolutionary idea in mind, which is that those who don't work or live off the work of others don't deserve to have property, and they don't even deserve to be, and that takes you to withstanding and to that communist movement within the framework of the English Revolution. But if you say that this Calvinism turned into Puritanism, meant something useful in production, meant something useful as an ideal for little people who wanted to create a better life, meant something even as a potentially revolutionary ideal, saying that those who work are the ones who should inherit the society. If you say all that, you are talking about a Calvinism that radically changes after the English Revolution. Because when those middle classes are succeeding, and when, after all, they have come to terms with the market, and when they have wealth in hand, then, after all, they pride themselves on their special merit and begin to turn against the poor. And so, the two long sections from that magnificent Richard Talk, who has taught us all one of these five people who ever wrote books, who ever influenced me. Like Richard Tony, who says, those who seek God in isolation from their fellow men, unless trebly armed for the perils of the quest, are apt to find not God, but a devil, whose countenance bears an embarrassing resemblance to their own. The moral self-sufficiency of the late 17th century purity nerved his will, but it corroded his sense of social solidarity. For if each individual's destiny hangs on a private transaction between himself and his maker, what room is left for human intervention? A spiritual aristocrat who sacrificed fraternity to liberty, that Puritan drew from his idealization of personal responsibility a theory of individual rights which, secularized and generalized, was among the most potent explosives the world has known. He drew from it also a scale of ethical values in which the traditional scheme of Christian virtues was exactly reversed, and which, since he was above all things practical, he carried as a dynamic into the routine of business and political life. For since conduct and action though availing nothing to attain the free gift of salvation, are a proof that the gift has been accorded. What is rejected as a means is resumed as a consequence, and the Puritan flings himself into practical activities with the daimonic energy of one who, all doubts allayed, is conscious that he is sealed and chosen as a vessel. Convinced that character is all, and circumstances nothing, he sees in the poverty of those who fall by the way, not a misfortune to be pitied and relieved, but a moral failing to be condemned, and enriches not an object of suspicion, but the blessing which rewards the triumph of energy and will. Tempered by self-examination, self-discipline, self-control, he is the practical ascetic whose victories are won not in the cloister, but on the battlefield, in the counting house, and in the market. And one final word from Tony before we lay him to rest. Few tricks of the unsophisticated intellect. You know, it takes years to write this way. <laughs> <laughs> the gorgeous wrote, uh, Tony never wrote except beautiful sentences. And they're all like Gothic cathedrals. I mean, they rise, you have to follow them around a bit, and then they descend. <laughs> <laughs>
few tricks of the unsophisticated intellect are more curious than the naive psychology of the businessman who ascribes his achievements to his own unaided efforts in bland unconsciousness of a social order without whose continuous support and vigilant protection he would be as, as a lamb bleeding in the desert. That individualist complex owes part of its self-assurance to the suggestion of Puritan moralists that practical success is at once the sign and reward of ethical superiority. Fans <coughs> by men of religion as a, 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 a no question argued a, a Puritan pamphlet here, but riches should be the portion rather of the godly than of the wicked. The demonstration that distress is a proof of demerit though a singular commentary on the lives of Christian saints and sages has always been popular with the prosperous. But the lusty plutocracy of the Restoration, roaring after its beat, having defeated the genuine revolution, and not indisposed, if you could not find it elsewhere, to seek it from God, it was welcomed with a shout of applause. Now, remember this. A society which reverences the attainment of riches as the supreme felicity will naturally be disposed to regard the poor as damned in the next world, if only to justify itself for making their life hell in this. <laughs>